Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief, and this is the one we've been waiting for all year. We are talking about the Burn World Championships, specifically about the speed and combined event, which is sending our very first climbers to the Paris Olympics. If you're interested in hearing more about the Lead World Championships and the Boulder World Championships from last week, watch the previous episode where John and I break that down. But of course, it's a big one, so we brought in some special guests. Um, as always, I'm Tyler Norton, joined by John Bergman, who writes for uh, the Climbing Business Journal and Climbing Magazine. And of course, he's the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. Also joined by another uh, frequent returning guest is Natalie Berry, an editor at UK Climbing, covering uh, everything climbing, but a lot of competition stuff. And then also joined by Megan Martin, a commentator for USA Climbing and the IFSC and co-host of Max. Uh, I don't know. How do I refer to this? Max's, the, the Max original sequel uh, uh <laughs> series the climb starring uh, neither of those two people in the image are megan just just in case you're unclear that is <laughs> jason momo and chris sharma john i like how you kindly sent me this as if our like you know our little video podcast with hundreds of viewers needed to promote content on hbo max like they needed any help or anything but yeah, oh. yeah. just trying to help out you know they can use they can yeah. use a boost Sure. For sure, for sure. I mean, with the whole name change thing, it's really confusing, right? Now we're just Max. It was HBO Max. Who knows what'll be next week? I don't know. <laughs> there you go. See, we're just we're doing we're doing a service to to unknowns like Chris Sharma and Jason Momoa. Just trying to help out. <laughs> All right. Well, a lot's uh, a lot's happened in the last week, and of course, this weekend was was extra special. So we might as well hop in with headlines. And and I asked our two special guests kind of like what their headlines were for this. So I'd like to start with Megan, who submitted uh, hers first. So Megan, headline from from the burn world championships what's it going to be so my headline was burn every hold counts um and that's more in reference to the combined format though you mean you have to use as many holds as you can to get to the buzzer for speed as well but yeah just a lot of close um point values for the athletes in the combined closer than we've ever seen and i feel like because the last olympics we had the combined with speed i think it's easy to look at results and be like, oh, this person's in first, this is in second. But like, it really doesn't matter. You really have to look at those point values and see like how close they are. And there were just so many times where it came down to like really like a hold or less than a hold that, you know, qualified someone for the Olympics or didn't qualify them for the Olympics. So it was just, I felt like I was on the edge of my seat the whole time. How about you guys? Were you like following along? Like, was it pretty easy to understand for everybody watching? Like you kind of knew where people had to get to? What do you think, Natalie? I think I found it kind of intuitive, like when I was watching, because you can see, like, obviously you get the Boulder results and it's all ranked and you've got time to kind of digest those results. But then what I realized in the lead was that while it's okay as you're watching it, because you're just watching the numbers go up, um, it's actually quite hard as a journalist to then report on the results and, like, like what what does it mean to readers like they got 44 points something out of like the ranking doesn't really matter as Megan said um it's more about the points but then it's also quite hard to gauge I think when I was watching it was quite hard to gauge because Matt Groom would say like they need to get to hold number 46 but hold number 46 has a completely different points value like it's not 46 46 plus as we're used to in standard mm-hmm. lead so you that need to was, get the hold 46 that, because that yeah, gets you 88 that, points yeah. or whatever. You yeah, know. yeah, that tripped me up. And then just, you know, thinking, oh, they have to get, she has to get at least 56.7, but then the hold value might be like 60 or something, or well, probably all 60, like, because they fall between the holds and you're trying to figure out in your head, like, what exactly, mm-hmm. which hold exactly do they need to get to? I mean, yeah. I don't know. I think for us as kind of informed viewers, it's maybe not so bad um, and we can kind of figure it out for ourselves. But I do, I'd love to speak to a non-climber and see what they think of this format compared to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Because at least in Tokyo, it was just like, well, yeah, they won that round. They came second here and it's kind of, the multiplication is quite tricky, but I still think there's a there's still there's still maths unfortunately 
I think that's yeah. a, an interesting contrast between between this and Tokyo because here I think when you're watching it, it's it's uh, much easier to pay attention to the actual holds. And when we talk about oh what they need to do in this case, we're talking about how far do you have to get to, what crux do you have to get to, what sequence you know on the wall do you have to get to to earn the points to move on. Whereas in Tokyo, it really didn't. We didn't talk about the climb at all. It was oh he has to do better than Jakob in the lead, whatever that means, right? But maybe for yourself, Natalie, where you're talking about trying to communicate this in the written word like maybe it is easier to say you know he had to overtake you know uh or yeah. you know uh, uh jacob schubert in order to secure this place rather than he had to get to hold 40 which means nothing to to a reader so yeah that's an interesting contrast because i did find this was easier to make sense of in the moment where is everybody what do you need to do to win than it was in tokyo but uh it, it certainly was a bit of a trade-off yeah john what about you I think there's kind of an inherent contradiction with this scoring, particularly the bouldering of this scoring compared to what we're used to. Because if you think of just a singular boulder final, what you want is you want a lot of variation in the scores, right? You want a lot of separation. You want to see some people able to get to the zone, other people not so much. Maybe some person almost top and somebody, you know, maybe they do get to the top. You want to see a kind of a a big spread, but here, I th and I think that that's, that's good too in the multiplication system for Tokyo, because you know, no matter what the spread is, there's going to be a, a one through eighth place, right? And, th and then that will be multiplied. But here, as I was watching the bouldering, I was thinking, gosh, I don't want them to actually be that spread out on the bouldering. I want their scores to be pretty close, pretty tightly packed, because that means that the lead then is all that more important, right? If you have somebody that like we kind of saw with, with Yanya in some cases, if she has an incredible bold around, it's like, she's already doing pretty well in the lead, you know, even with, without even going in lead yet. Um, I don't know if that really makes sense, but no, completely. Uh, like the, the experience of watching the women's compared to the men's was very different where it was like, yo, how, how is I Mori supposed to actually do like, and, and I just bring up I Mori because their point difference in the two boulder okay. rounds was actually quite steep compared to Yanya Garnbrett. Like it was a large gap. And so you go into lead being like, yeah, I Mori can do everything she can. And it's going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible to still win this. I think you're totally right. Whereas on the men's side, all those tighter scores, it gave us, honestly, in my opinion, a more exciting lead final because almost everybody was still in the game. For yeah. sure. Yeah. For the women, it was more like second and third only is what you were kind of concerned about because it was going to something really catastrophic would have had to happen for Yanya to somehow not qualify because she had stacked the points so high from the bouldering round and been so far ahead of everybody else. Yeah, I think you would look at the men's, for example, the men's bouldering round, and you would look at the results and you'd say, that's way too many tops. Like, that's awful. You don't want that many tops in a boulder round. But yet, it ended up being great because it, may, it meant that it all comes down to how they do on lead, and kind of anybody still had a shot, which is exactly what you want in the combined format. So, uh, yeah, like I said, a little bit of a a little bit of a difference in the mindset in terms of how you consume this. So the the people we walked away with as our as our, our top three, our podium finishers in combined, and we'll start with combined, of course, for the women, Yanya Garnbrett takes first, Jesse Pills takes second, and I'm Mori in third. And for the men, uh, Jakob Schubert in first, Colin Duffy in second, and Tomoa Narasaki in third place. Natalie, I wanted to use this as a jumping off point for your headline that you sent me. Uh, what's your headline and what's your take? So I tried to draw inspiration from the cheesy burn to climb. <laughs> hashtag. Yeah, hashtag burn to climb. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> so, forget the name somehow. Um, so my headline was the tables are turned in burn um, because there were just so many upsets and surprises um, in a good way, like unexpected results. Um, yeah, I guess where to begin um well let's let's use that like what what is your like biggest surprise you think from those combined results positive or negative i guess i'll start with tomorrow um because yeah one of the old guard um i didn't really expect him given his results this season and there was so much emphasis on serato you know everyone was like oh he's a dead set like he'll get in like he's gonna win paris and then yeah, Tomoa just pulls it out of the bag and lead and 
I don't know. It was one of the best moments of the competition for me, mm-hmm. like so much emotion, and then you know going over to Keio, um, and we actually got to see that response on camera, which was really good. Um, yeah, I just think, yeah, I wouldn't. Nobody would have predicted Tomoa, I don't think. And if you look in like in the Discord, for example, everyone was making bets and trying to predict the results, and I think the best anyone did was two out of six and one of them was Yanyo, which is kind of a gimme so yeah yeah <laughs> I don't know Tomoa I think... was hugely underrepresented in the picks but I don't think that was yeah. unfair like I mean yeah between Serato and and uh, you know we might come back to what our picks at the start of the year were but uh Tomoa hasn't hasn't been like at the very top level in bouldering that he has been and he's not somebody we really wanted to count on and lead in general so I I understand people having those picks but yeah what a killer climb Megan you had thoughts for a second I saw you I... <laughs> well I yeah it's just funny because like in my mind I never really I I even though Serato was doing so well this season I I just didn't necessarily see a place where he would probably qualify and Tomo wouldn't um and I say that just too because I think experience does play like a huge role still and I think that this competition for example was really important in terms of like just peaking at the right time um I think we saw that with a lot of the younger athletes or even um Mikhail doing so well in just the bouldering only discipline it's like some of these athletes sure they might have been it was the master plan. Um, doing so well. Yeah, yeah, this whole season. But it really, I mean, the season doesn't really matter as much as like this competition and the other qualifying competitions. So, yeah, I guess I'm surprised that people, you know, but this is normal. I think people are quick to count people out. I don't know if anyone watched that Sean White documentary, but it's like the minute someone's not at the very tip top of their game, mm-hmm. they're very quick to be like, oh, do they have it anymore? And I think that it's an interesting thing with athletes because I think a lot of athletes, if they've done it before, they can do it again. So you can never count them out. And I think Tomo is a great example of that. And also Jakob and Colin, as all three of them are already Olympians and they came out and absolutely crushed it. John, do you have any particular, like, uh, um, uh, I already forget what the word was, but who was your, what was your big surprise, positive or negative? Well, it's interesting. I, I couldn't resist crunching the numbers which is not my strong suit. So so anybody that wants to check my math, please, by all means. But I, I couldn't resist looking at the results or looking at the places, how everybody placed in the boulder and lead portions and doing the multiplication instead of the math. So in yeah. other words, if we had done, the, I don't know if maybe anybody in the Discord has done this yet, but I was thinking, okay, if we, if we kind of continued the Tokyo methodology, obviously without speed results as a multiplication factor in there. But if we just multiplied the person's place in Boulder and the person's place in lead, I don't actually think the men's Olympic berths change that much. It gets kind of tricky because there are some ties on the lead route. And then you're thinking, okay, well then do we count back to their place in the semifinals, right? There's some kind of tricks there, but I think the men's results end up being Jakob first, uh, Tomoa second and Colin third. So I think Tomoa and Colin would have swapped, but they both still would have earned the Olympic berth. And then I think Serato would have been fourth. It's a little mm. more heartbreaking if you're an American fan in the women's division, because I think Yanya would be, she'd finish first. I think second place Olympic berth would have been I Mori. Now I think Brooke Rabatou was second place at the end of bouldering yeah. And she was fifth place in lead. So she would have ended with uh, 10 points, right? Her second place times fifth place, two times five, 10, 10 points. Whereas Jesse Pills was third place. I'm looking at my chart here. Third place in the boulder. And she was fourth in lead. So she would have been 12, which been in her final score. So Brooke, Brooke 10 compared to Jesse 12. I think Brooke would have gotten that Olympic birth and which is uh you know woulda coulda shoulda it doesn't really matter because that's not the scoring format but it is interesting when you start playing with the different oh do we multiply the results do we add the results could have been different different universe i guess all right back to the original question what was your biggest surprise (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh there's um there's a few of them but like what what one are you like damn you know probably this kind of goes into what I was thinking when we were picking winners and losers, but I was probably Brooke not making, not getting the Olympic berth. I mm. just feel really gutted for her. And it, it kind of gets this weird metaphysical thing. But like, I remember in Tokyo, 
uh, for the Tokyo Olympics, it re- I actually wrote a piece about this. I said Brooke fulfills her Olympic destiny. It did feel like she was like destined to be an Olympian because if you go back in the climbing magazines in the 90s, when they thought Olympics could feature climbing in the 90s, everybody was writing about how DDA would be an Olympian and Robin would be an Olympian before they were even, you know, before Brooke was even born. And then DDA retired. But throughout the 90s, everybody was like, Robin, she'll be an Olympian when Olymp- when climbing makes its Olympic debut and all this. It didn't happen. Then Brooke gets the spot and it just kind of felt like, oh, that's destiny. That's perfect. So I kind of was getting that same sense here of kind of cosmic destiny because Brooke has had such a an incredible revelatory season leading up to this. She gets her first World Cup gold medal to kick off the season in Hachioji. And so I was just like, yeah, this would be the perfect bookend if she would conclude this season or not conclude. It's not over yet, but kind of conclude it with an Olympic invitation. And it seemed like she was on her way to do that, especially when the bouldering kicked off and she started off with those two two tops in the bouldering portion. I was I was just thinking, like, yeah, she's she's cruising. This is going to happen. She didn't. I felt pretty I, I like I said, I just felt pretty gutted for her and I was pretty surprised. Well, it's crazy, too, because like speaking of point values i think the difference with i calculated correctly was 2.8 points between her and i Mori, which is less than a hold theoretically on where they were in the route so that was just uh i'm with you it was like super hard to watch it was like uh i will say this though i feel like as an athlete for example is more prepared this time around uh for qualifying for the olympics and to be in the olympics so I think with those other chances to qualify, I feel like it's definitely highly possible. Whereas like the last Olympics, I feel like things were so much more up in the air with that combined format as well. And I do think, again, she's a different athlete than she was four years ago or however long ago. I think it's four years, right? (laughs) I guess it was technically three from the actual Olympics, but qualification longer than that. But I don't know. It's just interesting, which is, again when we go back to picking like winners and losers, I kept thinking about this a lot because it was kind of hard. Cause if you don't qualify here, just because they're only qualifying three people per gender and combined, and then two for speed, I feel like there's still so many winners because I, this should prove to them that they have a chance to qualify mm-hmm. again later. You know, I, that that's where I was having a hard time picking winners and losers for this event. It is, like talking about the format, just the last time we did this, pretty much every eligibility spot came from having to do well in one competition, right? You had to do, you had to be, what was it? Top seven at world championships or top six at the Toulouse qualifier or top one at a continental event, right? So plus with the weird quota stuff too, you could actually end up being lower. Right. But regardless, every qualification was how good are you this weekend, right? How good are you on the day? Whereas this time around, we have that OQS where we're taking only the top ranked athletes. You get to climb over multiple events. So we get a bit more of an average. And that's where for me, like somebody like Brooke is is guaranteed this time, like knock on wood for sure. But <laughs> like Brooke is as guaranteed as anybody else right now to get one of those spots. And I think the feel that we're going to get this time around is going to be a lot more justified uh, than mm-hmm. the one last time. Not not that the, the people who made it to the Olympics last time around were like unfit to be Olympians. But I think I think you're going to see a lot more of the favor and and fewer like kind of yeah. edge cases because of that those 10 spots per gender being allocated for a ranking based system which will which will hopefully make a lot of more sense um megan what was your biggest surprise uh from combined or if you want to do speed i guess but from combined i guess well, okay so uh, that's up to you um well i was gonna say though i do think it's interesting that none of the world record holders qualified for speed mm-hmm. right like that is just an interesting fact of the entire event because speed obviously as we know is the most rehearsed discipline but it also can have these crazy moments and I feel like and again not to say that I I do feel like those athletes will have a good chance to qualify later but it is surprising that on both the men and women's side none of the record holders qualified in two of the spots per gender yeah yeah, yeah, I'm sure we'll talk about speed really soon, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, my my biggest one is like it has to be Natalia Grossman. 
is like that mm-hmm. was this is was such a stunningly bad comp for and I you know I thought about Adam and his were kind of like you know errors and and kind of very Adam esque way to not qualify for the Olympics it was just like you know kind of <laughs> I don't know if it's just in, in his head or, or just you know kind of kind of like messing up the simple stuff it feels like kind of the theme uh, uh, the theme for this go round but Natalia Grossman is is like one of the best female climbers of the last of this Olympic cycle by far, right? She is second place probably to Yanya Garnbrett in terms of quality and bouldering and lead. And it all fell apart. You can say this season or you can say at this event, but her not even making like the, she wasn't in the combined final, right? Am I? Am I she was one yeah, she spot was, out. She was I in think. ninth, right? Yeah. Um, I it's it seems so wrong. I had to double check to say that she wasn't in the top eight for this discipline was unreal. Um, and uh, I, I I don't really know what to make of it, but but maybe John, this is where we can talk. Finally, you know, we spent this whole season being like, how do we judge American progress this season? Like, how do we judge the U.S. team? And every time we're like, you know, put on the brakes. We'll talk about it after the World Championships because that's what everybody's trying to like peak towards. So, what do we think? Like, are are the two American so that qualified for the Olympics at this event the two that we expected going into uh, going into Bern? Like it. For sure, it was Natalia and Brooke, if anybody was going to qualify. Like, I didn't have any bets on the men. For speed, Emma Hunt was, like, kind of a toss-up. Like, she could easily be, like, top two, but I kind of figured she would she would qualify at, at the next event. Um, yeah, what did you think, Natalie, as the, as the least... Uh, as the least invested in North American <laughs> climbing? Or should, what, do you, what do you think from that side of the pond? Yeah, I chose not to talk about the Americans. <laughs> you guys would like to talk about <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Like, I think last year I was guilty of hyping Natalia and being like, yeah, she's she's definitely going to qualify. But I'm not sure. I think we've seen that she's been slightly off par like throughout this season. And I wasn't sure that she would get a spot. I'm not sure why. And maybe I think Brooke has looked a lot more consistent throughout the World Cups Um, I just wasn't really sure where she was at and whether you know some climbers are championship climbers where they just pull out all the stops and manage to climb really well and do better than World Cup performances but yeah I mean I certainly thought she would make combined finals or combined semi-finals quite easily so that was quite an upset and the fact that she was just one spot out as well that was really kind of heartbreaking um but yeah, I just I don't think she's in top form at the moment, and I mean I think the Pan Ams will be really um, exciting between Brooke and Natalia and uh, Annie as well. Like I definitely I would have put Natalia over Annie um, to make the finals, but yeah, I'm not I'm just not really sure um, where she's at. But yeah, I, I definitely a huge upset. Megan, as something like, well, actually, for, for anybody that doesn't know, both Megan and Natalie both have competitive climbing experience up to a World Cup level. So so I, I feel a little bit more comfortable asking this question. Neither of you can relate to the Olympic uh, uh, aspect of things. But I, I just want to ask you, Megan, to start. Um, what do you think the pressure has been like on Natalia Grossman heading into this year? Has she not been the ultimate favorite, the flag bearer the poster child the metal the breadwinner for usa climbing now for three years like is there anybody else that has remotely the same amount of pressure that natalia grossman has had coming into 2023 i was gonna say i'm glad you brought that up because i was gonna say just you know in comparing the current annie for example like annie's going into the season with no pressure and i agree that natalia has all of the pressure and not only the pressure of you know being so successful the last three years but also having not already been an Olympian, I think that's like probably weighing heavy on her as well. So I think it is a lot to handle and we've seen her kind of do this all season. And I think that has a lot to do with that pressure. And, you know, she's risen to the occasion a few times, but then crumbled quite a few times. And unfortunately at this event, we kind of saw that happen. Um, I agree. Pan Americans is going to be very exciting this year. Um, For the last one, no American woman could even qualify. But for this one, basically any country has a shot, which I think is 
pretty cool. And I think the field is going to be very stacked. And honestly, I think I'm going to have a hard time watching because I think I'm going to be so stressed (laughs) because all these athletes could possibly, you know, have a great day. But yeah, I think, I think Natalia is dealing with a lot. And I was going to say too, you know, some of the athletes that have been in this for a long time, Yanya, for example, or even, even Jakob, I would say like, obviously Yanya dealt with that injury and she took some time off, but like Jakob didn't do as many comps this year. And I feel like that's something that Natalia maybe could have done. I think that she did way more comps than she needed to. And perhaps it might've been a good choice to kind of lighten her load a bit, especially with all that added pressure. John, what do you think? I think I agree with Megan there. I, and there also is this X factor of this ongoing ailment that she's been dealing with some Mm -hmm. sort of stomach thing. We've never really gotten the full story there. Not that we, not that we, she has any obligation to give us the full story. I'm just saying just as simply as people that are watching this, we don't really know exactly what's going on there and, and the severity of it. And, and to that point, we don't know whether or not that played a part in this as well, the, the, the physical stuff as much as maybe there was this mental weight and, and mental pressure, because she has certainly had ups and downs this year. I kind of thought that she would be okay handling the pressure. Granted, world championship pressure and Olympic pressure is something that is probably way greater than World Cup pressure, obviously, but also, you know, it's hard for me to even kind of speculate about it. But I know that, it, for example, the season as she's stacked these World Cup wins on top of each other, right? And she wins and then she wins the next World Cup and then she wins the next World Cup. That comes with its own brand of pressure, too. Like it takes skill to be able to kind of uh, sort of continue to perform with the mounting pressure of like, oh, can she win two in a row? Can she win three in a row? And she proved Guilty, that she can yeah. <laughs> and, and she proved that she can do that, right? So I, I was kind of thinking like, okay, well she's proven that her mental kind of acuity can be pretty sharp in that sense. So this is a next the next step up from there, maybe by several degrees. But uh yeah, I don't know, it just kind of seemed like maybe a little out of sorts the whole the whole world championships here. Uh, the the really thing that really strikes me is imagine that you didn't watch her performance in the combined portion, the semifinals, and and I had only told you that she got ninth place, and I said that her score was eighty eight point one, and that's all that you knew. And I said, what do you think happened? How do you think she got that score? I logic would tell you, well, she probably did a did a really solid bouldering portion, and then really. St- kind of struggled in lead right because she is the the boulder specialist she's certainly proficient at lead as well but bouldering is her her big you know discipline where she's she's kind of the ruler or one of the rulers but that's not what happened at all if you look at how things played out she actually her her boulder round proved to be the really problematic one in the lead round she got in the semifinal lead round she got to the lip of the head wall 54.1, I think, was the score. Same score as Jesse Pills, for crying out loud. Molly Thompson-Smith, same score as well. So that's like that's good company for for the lead route. I think Natalia did fine on lead. It was really the bolder portion in the semis that that really put her in a too big of a hole. I don't think she had any tops on the boulders. She finished with a a, a, a 34.4. 34.4, when you think... Like geez, like even one top is twenty five points, and and she didn't yeah. she didn't get a top thirty four point four for kind of a boulder specialist. That is kind of doomsday. You got to think, and we've always said whether it's a three event combined format or if it's just this two event combined format, you have to do good or great in your specialty discipline. Like if you don't, it's a, it's I don't want to say it's over because we saw for instance like I Mori kind of. Um, kind of well she did do well in her special she did great in lead yeah like if you don't do well in your specialty it's it's kind of you're in too deep of a hole and i think that's kind of what befell natalia here let's uh let's keep going on the specialty discipline thing and talk about i mori and and the results she was able to pull off 
uh, uh, this weekend. I figure we might as well just kind of like stick with the women at this point and we'll, we'll, we'll come back to visit the men. Um, I'm worried, like I think was one of the favorites for all of this. So it's, it's not necessarily, um, like a surprise, I guess, but the entire competition, she was having to fight back from, from rough boulder rounds. And that was probably the most exciting thing about having Imori kind of at the bottom of this running order is, you know, she's going to have to make up ground in every single lead climb that she gets on. Cause she's starting from the literal bottom in, in, well, I guess literal is not the right word. Like in the, she's starting from the bottom in terms of the actual wall. And of course, from the scoreboard also, um, and, and living up to the reputation she's building for herself of being a, uh, a solid climber i think in the press conference if i remember right she kind of mentioned like oh yeah the climbs are like pretty crimpy so it's like my kind of jam and we didn't <laughs> see a lot of like you know the, the the joke now especially after last week is of course we didn't see a lot of like dynamism like we didn't see a lot of like dynamic moves that they had to, <laughs> had to had to fight through um but crushing it and pushing the high points every every single time they got on the wall um my question is like is this sustainable do you think over like we have, I guess the reality is we haven't actually gotten to watch that many combined competitions in this format, right? Um, but my question is like, do we think it's actually possible to podium at the Olympics when you have such a huge imbalance in your scores? And of course, on any given day, the route setting can totally change it up. And Imori has meddled in Boulder World Cups before, so so maybe it works out. But do we think she has like a, a winning or a podium strategy? Can she perform like on her on her like is she is she actually in contention for an olympic uh uh um uh medal basically with this kind of point balance i don't know who wants to take that first like do you think she i think she's i think a medal yes but not a gold Mm -hmm. and i say that because she does have that huge disadvantage in the fact that if they do throw dynamic moves in there she's gonna struggle a bit more um and and that bouldering round for the final, like her score was forty four point five, which was really like only ten less than what Miho and Orion got in their bouldering scores. So like she had a solid bouldering round for herself point wise, to where she kind of set herself up to just have to do what she ca- is capable of on the route. Obviously, um, things had to play out in her favor as well with other athletes. But I think that, you know, we could very well see that happen again, depending on the setting at the Olympics, right? Something like that. I think she would, it would be very hard for her to overtake Yanya though, because Yanya's skill set is um, just a little deeper, I think. And the way that I get shut down, I mean, I like looking at Boulder four in the Boulder round. I was like, Oh my gosh, like (laughs) she's going to hate this climb. This is like everything that she's not good at. Um, But, but then I saw the lead route and I was like, Oh my gosh, this route was made for her. Like she's going to absolutely love every single second of this route and could likely top it, you know? So I do think metal contention is perfectly um, appropriate to predict for her. Now she could easily not, have that happen depending again on the setting but i i couldn't predict a first place like olympic gold i think that that would be a far reach unless she you know improves her dynamic climbing um in the next however many days before the olympics <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i should know the days but <laughs> less than less than 365 something like yeah, that that's yeah, all we yeah. got yeah. Less, <laughs> less than a year to yeah. improve. i mean i think she's gonna have to do some box jumps like like, like something you know <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah natalie think, you have any thoughts john yeah, yeah natalie go for it i'll, I'll yeah. piggyback off of off of yours i think she absolutely needs to work on her dynamic skills because i don't know we've only seen a couple of combined competitions but i can't really see the olympics not having some kind of funky <laughs> showstopper yeah. move. just like, pandering pandering to the audience and just like <laughs> yeah. you know yeah i hear you because I don't know, I can see maybe the root setters at the moment, they're not that experienced in the combined, so they're just playing it safe and just kind of doing crimp ladders, <laughs> endurance fest, just to, you know, not have any upsets. But I think if they start taking more risks, then I'm already, she's going to have to build on you know, her lashy or whatever you call them, swings and <laughs> jumps. And yeah, I, I thought it was one thing I, I noticed, it was, 
a bit of a shame in the lead because you're so focused on lead adding to the boulder score that you kind of forget about lead as a the individual discipline and you're like okay so who actually won who came second who came third it's not as clear as in bouldering and it just kind of gets okay yanya's won but actually i got four points more and yeah i know it's not about individual disciplines but i think it's a bit of a shame for the lead climbers because they get kind of overshadowed a bit by the whole combined result Mm. Um, but yeah Yeah. I, i think i has great potential at the olympics but like you guys said i don't think it'll be gold unless she becomes we gotta we gotta get we gotta ship out sean mccall and and he can teach the (laughs) short guys with big jumps course over there like this is how we do it in ninja warrior and i can't remember how tall he is but like he's one of the shorter of the uh, he that dude can jump and he has to like no no no, you're right right. i'm sure you climbed at at, at a bunch of world cups with him and and he of course he him lead climbing his most magical moments are where you just see this guy just absolutely ball up and launch for like un unreasonable launches on a lead rope right and of course he took those same skills to bouldering and uh yeah so maybe that's our export is uh is uh <laughs> is sending him out across the pacific yeah john what, what did you ever think i agree with megan and natalie that c- kind of all things being equal if everything goes as it should then i Mori is going to have a really hard time getting a gold medal a unlikely you know getting a gold medal because of that because of her lack of <laughs> dynamic that's going to be like the buzz whenever we say yeah. dynamic and bells are going to ring her yeah. di- whenever we because she does have that lack of dynamic proficiency in boulders however this is where i think the the um addition type of scoring could help her as opposed to the multiplication type of scoring because remember at the tokyo olympics the the women got very very shut down on those boulders a lot of it one of the worst really really hard (laughs) and it's like if the boulders are hard if it's a multiplication score it almost doesn't matter because you're still going to have somebody in first place and you're going to have somebody in whatever last place sixth place whatever it is but if the boulders are really hard and it's it's just a point scoring thing you could very well have you know yanya with whatever 25 points 50 points that's it right and then you could have i mori with 30 points or like it it, it could be a lot tighter on the scores uh, heading into the lead round and it's not at all impossible to think if if yanya and i and anybody else are only separated by uh, maybe like 10 points or something on from the boulder round that you could easily see i mori getting three moves higher than everybody else or whatever, four moves higher on the head wall if it's a really hard lead route. So uh, I, it's like, yeah, if the if the setting goes as we think it should, then I think Imori is going to have a really hard uphill climb getting the gold medal. But um, if the boulders are particularly hard and a lot of people get shut down, maybe there's a couple slabs and Yanya, as we've seen, Yanya can, you know, she has some struggles on slab as she did here in the finals. I think that was the one, uh, what was it? Boulder two was the slab. She missed her initial launch for the top, even though she got it later. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it, like the, <laughs> the, the one thing she didn't quite get to the top of on a first try. Yeah. Well, Boulder 4. Was that, well, the final I was going to say yeah, 4, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, Only true. Miho did yeah. 4. Yeah. yeah. So, what do you think, Tyler? Let's throw it to you. Throw it to the host. Uh, I'm worried. <laughs> what do you think chances? I, I can only ask questions. I don't have any answers. No, I think I think that what I've been like, uh, when I was making predictions about like who could do well, I kind of sorted athletes into K are like, are you exceptional at this discipline? Are you very good at this discipline? And then are you just fine at this discipline? And so like Yanya Garnbrett is the one climber who I would say is exceptional at both. All right. Somebody like Brooke, I would say is very good in both. I Mori though, she is uh, I'm trying to figure out which fingers here. She's good in, uh, very good in bouldering, <laughs> but exceptional in lead, right? And so I was trying to like, okay, so if somebody's like, I would say, so I Mori should be better than Brooke because she's kind of got a leg up in one of the disciplines. And and I think what emphasizes that is getting into the high parts of these climbs, whether it's boulder or lead, gets you the most points. So if somebody like Brooke is getting to the second zone on all four boulders, she's walking away with what 40 points uh across the round 
If she's flashing to if, it. If, assuming, assuming they flash it, right? But there is those 60 extra points in that final section in total of all those boulders. So there's kind of like there's there's more points for getting towards the very like top end of boulders and the same thing for the lead right those top 10 moves top 10 moves yeah have 40 points up there and so somebody like i only just has to like keep up just kind of in the middle of the field in bouldering and then do like get into those high points if no one else does kind of so i I guess what i'm trying to say is like being exceptional in one discipline has its reward and for i obviously we saw that play out this weekend where just getting into those last 10 moves you you get just uh, uh, uh an inordinate number of points from being up there so i'm i'm kind of like half and half the the downside is you have to do well in lead climbing and get into those point zones and you have to hope that the other people don't right that's the the hard part is like with with all this it is as always is very setting dependent and so it's hard to say and that's why i i i don't consider like i uh, a candidate for a gold medal i think a a, a podium is possible but again it kind of has to be a good day for imori and a good day for imori probably doesn't include many tops in bouldering so it it is like you're kind of riding the rails i see somebody like brooke just having a more diverse skill set is still a more likely candidate to get a gold medal or uh, or any medal yeah. in uh, in honesty. I agree. Yeah, yeah, but let's just to look at it hypothetically. Let's say it's a, a hard boulder round, and let's say who's ever in the, whoever is leading the way gets a top to twenty five flash to the top, and then they get maybe. Um, the don't do high... attempts, please. Don't do it. Just no, do... no, no. Just yeah, yeah okay, cool. I... and then they get a high, <laughs> high zone on all on the three other boulders. So, so they're twenty five score... plus thirty. So their score would be fifty five. Yeah. Right. And then let's say somebody like Imori, since we're talking about her, let's say Imori only gets to the high zone on all four boulders. Mm-hmm. So her score is forty. Yeah. So it's forty compared to a fifty five. That does not seem at all out of reach, right? For a, I mean, you think if there's a crux on the lead route that could throw that person, whoever got the 55, they could throw them off and then I can cruise ahead of it. Like, I don't know when you're, it, this is what it goes back to what I was saying about the, the added scoring as opposed to the multiplication scoring. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a lot more unpredictable this way. Well, and I think that also just highlights the fact that at the end of the day, this format does seem to still be better for your lead specialist or exceptional lead climbers, right? Because lead is a little more uh, consistent boulders. You have four boulders still and like anything can happen points wise. And if you're banking on getting points in boulder, like on a, on a hard day, you might not get enough. So I guess that brings up the flaw with the format a little bit. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. like we said, you're you're way st- – sorry, Natalie. I, I was just going to say you're way, like statistically more likely to top a lead route than to flash mm-hmm. all four boulders. So I think yep. it definitely does, um, like you said, Megan, like sort of the lead specialists do have a little – a little uh, maybe something extra here, a little advantage. Yeah, someone on Twitter did some maths and using like standard deviation and statistics and all that kind of geekery. And it was really interesting. I wish I could remember the name. But they like had a big spreadsheet and they looked at like where the scores were really close in the bouldering and it was always the lead specialists that were then getting on the podium because lead just played into <laughs> their hands basically because hmm. just the way the numbers worked and the maths. Um, I, should, I, I should take this opportunity. Cuba, Glof, uh, yeah. Sorry, who did you say it was? Cuba? Cuba, Glof. Glovka? Yeah, yeah, Polish. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I, yeah, we might be able to link out to that if uh, if I find it. I should say, John, you were wondering if anybody in the Discord like did the multiplication scoring math. Somebody did. I'm pretty sure it was Christy. I'm not 100 percent sure. So whoever whoever did it, shout out <laughs> shout out to them for for putting that together. Um, let's talk about. I uh, there's like two more women that we need to talk about, and I think we'll we'll do the easy one first, which is Yanya Garnbret. Um, I think like Natalia or Natalie, you kind of said in doing predictions, if you pick Yanya, it's kind of a gimme. It's not quite a skilled prediction, right? Um, I don't really know if there's much to say about her climbing from from this week. Um, the one thing I wanted to kind of talk about was like Yanya as the stateswoman and her like her persona and how it has evolved over the over the last couple seasons. And I find it's so intriguing that we get this refrain from her 
uh, in these in these post comp interviews where she's kind of emphasizing the point of of like it doesn't get old. I'm always grateful for these for these wins and things like that. And I I kind of just wanted to like ask when you guys hear that a lot do you think it's genuine do you think something changed in her career where it made her kind of like value these things more where she wants to talk about it or or does this seem like and i'll just this is the way i read it is like yanni is kind of realizing she is kind of above the sport at this point it's like she's she's almost not a competitor she is entering like figurehead status like just straight up she is she stands separate from everything else that goes on. I'm kind of just curious how you read this, how she's been presenting herself. Um, any Anything you guys take away from from the way Yanya has evolved in the last couple of years? I don't know if it's something you've thought about. It's just something that came to mind for me. I do yeah. think that... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. You go. <laughs> no, 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 you can go. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I think whenever she gets interviewed and whenever she wins there's always this really raw emotion. So I, d I don't think she's just saying it. Like, I think genuinely she feels, she does feel the pressure. Like I interviewed her in London last year and she was like, I, you know, I put pressure on myself as much as other people put pressure on me. And with every win, it just gets harder for her to keep that going. And we've seen what happens when, she does slip up or things don't go her way or she gets injured and she loses confidence um and I think in the last year since she injured her toe um she, she's never really had to face that kind of climb back up from second place <laughs> or you know just maybe she didn't make semi semi-finals once or twice but it's just really unusual for her to face that kind of adversity on top of all the pressure and she just yeah she doesn't take any win for granted I think she does just have to take each competition as it comes and treat it like the first win ever and she just genuinely seems so emotional and moved every time she wins and I think this weekend as well it, there was a lot of stuff going on back home with the flooding so that just added maybe that just was kind of bubbling under and made her even more emotional on the podium and in the interviews yeah I totally agree with everything you're saying I I think it's a super genuine response and I feel like you know she has this opportunity to possibly be an Olympic gold medalist for the second time in a row like making history again. So like every time she has an event that's, you know, important or difficult for her to, or not difficult necessarily, but, you know, a big deal for her to win. I think it's just another sign like that this other goal could come to fruition later on. So I think that she is probably grateful to see, you know, her hard work paying off as she's like approaching her ultimate goal. Yeah, I think, and we'll we'll talk about the speed climbing soon. But it, I think a lot of what uh, Alexandra Miroslaw experienced this weekend is probably what people like Yanya are always having to prepare for and be afraid of: is mm -hmm. what happens in that moment where I lose the streak? What happens in the moment where you know all of a sudden the wins stop? Whether it's just for one, or maybe maybe you never win again. Like it's it's a, a probably yeah. a daunting prospect when people just kind of expect a win every single time. Um, and she's had all these other women like clipping at her heels, sure. you know, as the years have gone on. So she kind of knows she can't really be off her game at all. Yeah. John, can I, can I twist the, the discussion and throw Jesse pills at you? Can I, uh, uh, can I throw you a curveball and, and instead ask you about what you thought about Jesse and, and the Austrian resurgence and all of a sudden, Jesse's a, a, a top tier boulderer again. And uh, yeah, what did you what did you think? Yeah, it's interesting to think about Jesse and also along with Jacob, uh, because I was thinking about they Jesse Pills as, as we're sitting here talking about Yanya being a qualifying for the Olympics again. It's like, yeah, well, Jesse Pills qualify. This is her second mm -hmm. Olympics too, uh, and and or will be her second Olympics. This will be Jacob's second olympics uh, it, it, i think in a sense both of them jacob and jesse 
they kind of i don't know if you'd say it's unfortunate but they just they, they are resi- they are existing in the era of yanya and i was thinking about this and i was thinking yeah sometimes it seems like maybe the yanya spotlight as it is deserved but it takes some of the spotlight like some of the sheen off of Jesse and off of Jakob because I I was thinking gosh as much as people discuss Yanya being the potential goat right the potential greatest of all time you could make a really compelling argument for Jakob to be the goat as well in the men's division uh, but it's just kind of for some reason Jakob and, and Jesse too they kind of Jesse Jesse doesn't have quite the accolades that that Jakob does obviously but they just kind of get kind of just I don't know like lost in the shuffle lost in the Yanya shuffle a little bit and it's too bad but um because I don't think Tyler we've talked about Jesse that much this whole season when we've done these debriefs kind of like Colin Duffy it's like okay maybe she hasn't had the best season but you got to give her credit for doing what she needed to do when it had to be done right she she can you we we can keep her out of the conversation for this whole season it doesn't matter here she did it she did what she what she came to do and um i'm excited to see what she can what she can do at these next olympics now that she she'll have some experience under her belt olympic experience Megan, we're we're very cat friendly on this on this podcast. I'm sure I'm sure viewers would sometimes rather just look at somebody's cat than listen to what John and I are talking about. So it's, it's all good. Don't, don't clearly don't, the, the don't. cat is a big Jesse Pill. The, the cat hears yeah. we're talking about Jesse Pills yeah. and is like, oh, I gotta get in on this conversation. Yeah. I think uh, he's like, I have so many thoughts. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting, John, when you talk about them being kind of like absent from the conversation. I think it's probably for different reasons. Like Jesse has been probably present more often than Jakob, but of course we don't see her very often as like a as a top tier and when I say top tier I mean like finalist boulder competitor and elite climbing just hasn't had a lot of the gold medal success that we would talk about for for somebody like Yanni Garnbrett or I Mori is kind of the other name right now um so just somebody that's just like not at the tip of your tongue and then Jakob I think is a bit more uh like self-imposed and just not showing up that much especially since the last Olympics really taking time to rest taking time to get away from comp climbing and possibly it's part of the the master plan and and you know I'm here to peak for world championships and I've been doing this for over a decade and and the other thing for Jakob talking about the goat conversation is just like again I'm 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 gonna reiterate this more and more often because I think it is something I need to pay more attention to when I hear people respond to the podcast we put out or in the YouTube comments or like what the general, you know, like kind of like hive mind thinking is about climbing is that most people watching comp climbing have only been watching it for maybe like two years or less. There are some people who are Imori fans who aren't aware that she was in the running to compete in Tokyo. There are people who think Jakob, Schubert is the GOAT because he just won a bunch of world championship medals this year and they don't realize that he's been winning world championships going way back and more importantly like had a stunning like seven world cup run won seven world cups in a row like 12 years ago 12 years ago Um, the context is just like not there for most viewers to understand who Jakob Schubert is right and that's that's like a failing for a lot of different parts of our sport, right? There's certainly content to do around somebody that has as many medals as he has that's competed against so many generations of people. And that's why he was a favorite that so many of us picked, even though the men's field is notoriously volatile and trying to pick a winner in any men's competition is almost always a fool's errand. What's your safe bet? It's going to be somebody like Jakob Schubert, right? Um, Yeah, completely. Um, But Jesse Pills, bolder round of her life, right? Like, is that something that we can expect more of? Like, that's that's kind of the thing we're talking about a Brooke and a Jesse is I would, you know, if we go to the Olympics, if we run this simulation multiple times, I don't I don't have her on the podium, but this was an excellent round. And I'm, I'm, you know, she talked about how it was kind of a tough week for her, like lots of pressure. The climbing was hard. uh, But I mean, she she walked away with a great prize. And and don't let anybody forget that Austria is one of the biggest names in comp climbing, not just because of Jakob, right? That team goes deep yeah. for decades. Um, Anna so yeah. Kelly. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my possible headlines was like Austrians back on top because it's like, I mean, they just qualified two people out of the combined, um, which they're the only country that did that, right? I don't think. In combined, yeah, yeah. yeah. In combined, yeah. So, which I think is huge. Um, 
yeah, Jesse had an amazing bouldering round. And that goes back to the point thing. She was 0.8 behind Brooke, I think. So mm-hmm. going into lead, they basically had the same score. And then she climbed like we've seen her climb in the past on the route. Um, maybe not as consistently this last season, but you know, there was a time where she was, you know, consistently on the podium and lead and she had one of those moments. So it was really cool to see her experience that. And I personally was so psyched for Jakob. Um, the fact that he's like you were saying, I mean, he's been around for so long and he's, I mean, he ended up with a bronze at the Olympics, which was incredible. And then to be able to, you know, qualify and win this competition and he's 32 like I have a soft spot for all of that so I was so psyched to just see that happen and he looked amazing and it's just really cool I, I I hope to see more of that from people I mean the same with like when we see Jane Kim back in the competition it's like you just there's something about it where you're like yes this is amazing like you can keep doing these competitions for longer than you think and like really excelling at them it feels cool to just like recognize that our cohort is like still killing it. You're like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe yeah. for the two of you, you're like, yeah, we did world championships. Like we were at the same youth world championships together, possibly. Right. Yeah. Like maybe not yeah. in the same category, but, but you were probably saw, you know, Jane Kim at a youth worlds or, or a Jakob Schubert at a youth worlds, you know, like that's, that's real. Like, I'm not John. I, I'm I don't, I don't even know how old John is. I just know he looks, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, <laughs> your your cohort is long gone, man. But well, I was good. gonna say I was gonna say Mikhail also. Mikhail's in that same cohort. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, when he won bouldering, I was like, "What? That's amazing!" Yeah. I couldn't believe yeah. it. I was like, "That's so awesome." Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you guys do you guys think there is something to the idea? Like it, in climbing, it's kind of tough because again, Jakob doesn't show up at a lot of World Cups, and when he does, his results are up and down, particularly in bouldering, right? But do you think there is something to like he just knows better, or he he is just a more practiced athlete that has just done this enough times? Because the the and, and not to take away from him, but it kind of changes the angle when you say like he was winning world championships when he was young, right? When he mm-hmm. was up against the Ramon Julians and, and Romain de Grange and, and all these names that go way back. He was still doing it back then. So sometimes I'm like, yeah, you know what? He has this huge, you know, this upper hand because he's so experienced. But maybe it's just a Yanya thing where it's like he was just good from the get go and he just hasn't let go of it. He's just better. Like I, sometimes I'm, I'm not quite sure. And that's as somebody that's never been a competitive athlete, I'm really like, I, I have no, no idea how any of that works, but I was curious if you guys had any notes on it, like for, particularly for the two athletes. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, in like a Yanya and a Jakob, for example, like they're like, when I look at them, like they're true competitors. Competition is where they thrive. I wouldn't say that about every athlete that has been successful in competition. But I think that the reason Jakob can come back and do that kind of thing is because he has this specific edge that he's always had. And even if he does go up and down, you just can't count him out because he is capable of, you know, winning at any time. Yeah, I think Jakob's superpower is his tenacity. Simple as that. I think it's actually, it's a skill to be able to, try really hard it sounds silly but you're just to keep going when you're really pumped and really tired or you think you think you've messed up or he just he so rarely so rarely makes a mistake as well um where you see adam kind of his foot slips or he messes up a sequence so yeah he's a really good technically accomplished climber Jakob. but i think what distinguishes him from a lot of competitors is his tenacity and the confidence that he's got on the wall just he just keeps going like he doesn't let anything get in the way like even when he's slightly behind in qualifiers or like just squeaks in um he just gives it everything I think he uses that as fuel and he just doesn't let go basically (laughs) he just holds on and keeps going there, there was kind of like a, a happy warrior vibe where he comes into it like, this is where I'm supposed to be and I feel great. And he he looked like he was enjoying everything and he looked like he wanted to be there. And all, I guess what it almost looked like he wasn't under pressure. Whereas sometimes when I would, well, often when I would look at Adam, 
it looked like he was trying to shake something off. He was like, I'm trying to ignore the fact that there is so much pressure here. And then for kids like Toby and Serato, I, I'm really not that good at reading them quite yet. I just don't know them well. We haven't seen them for a lot. But man, like their experience is obviously going to be very different from Jacob's and from Adam's who have been through this multiple times and know what it feels like to be behind a big crowd and to see all the cameras and and uh, and all the microphones out and the pressure of the Olympics and whatnot. Um, I, I want to use this as a chance to like kind of like rotate and talk about somebody like Serato, talk about somebody like Toby, um, the expectations we have, if it's reasonable, it, what you just you kind of have general notes on these two climbers. And and for Toby, I think, like Adam, we have to talk about having this, this you know, awful low fall, which is forgivable for anybody. Everybody's got one of those in their career, right? Everybody's got a low slip or a, and it wasn't even that low, right? Um, but everybody's got those those weird little slips. But how do you as a as a young climber like take that and then move into the into like a further round and and have confidence in yourself and uh and and be willing to fight against like all these legendary names that are sitting beside you and stuff like that's got to be some kind of extraordinary experience, right? John, what do you think? Uh, it, yeah, it's almost the kind of the reverse of what happened at Tokyo, which if you think about the Tokyo Olympics and the qualification pathway for that, we were thinking it was going to be these veterans that would likely qualify the Sean McCall's, the uh, who else, like um, uh, Jan Hoyer, uh, Sean Coxie, right? Like all the, th these names. And then you have somebody like Colin Duffy, who is the youngster that all of a sudden kind of shines, not out of nowhere, but I think for all intents and purposes, kind of out of nowhere to the to the casual viewer, right? If you remember at the Pan Ams, uh, when Colin qualified, everybody was thinking it might be Sean Bailey that would get that spot, and then and then Colin ends up taking it. So it was it was kind of like we the, the young names weren't really on the tip of our tongue until they actually did qualify. Whereas, which is kind of very different here with when we we do have. Toby and Serato that kind of have felt like these people that would likely qualify. And then it, it does end up being at least so far, we don't want to, we don't want to, there's plenty of more qualification potential left, but so far it has been kind of the veterans that have shined. And I'm sure some of that was because this all was happening at, this wasn't just the Olympic qualification. It was a world championships on top of that. It was what, a, like 10 days of climbing prior to that or something like that. There was just, so much that built up to this combined final and with Toby and with Serato, it's like you were saying, Tyler, it's not like these guys did bad at all, but, and Annie Sanders for that matter, right? She's young and she did great as well. But I do think a story for much of this world cup season has been, wow, these, these youngsters, these 16 years old, 17 year olds, they're climbing kind of beyond their years. They just it's like Toby and they Serato, they seem to have so much poise that you wouldn't necessarily expect for a 16 year old or a 17 year old. And in some ways, I think this combined final, these were, it was, it was kind of like, okay, like, yeah, this is, this is kind of what you would expect like a normal 16 year old to, to, to be nervous and to have some anxiety about this to, perfectly acceptable response for this. And, 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 it's just kind of interesting. We hadn't really seen that from a lot of them up until now. And it may be finally the, the magnitude of it all kind of caught up with them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that sneeze made me laugh. <laughs> I like muted my <laughs> you, we, you just we just got the very top of it um let me let me throw a a, a question uh to natalie like toby roberts didn't make it through at this event does the qualification path uh like is he the favorite for the european qualifications because obviously mejdi shalk will almost certainly be in that finals he missed it this time around possibly paul yenft again but now you've got to repeat against adam andra and you got to repeat against magos and you got to repeat against yannick floy i'm just looking down the the combined rankings right now right like do you think this was an easier chance for him or do you do you think like the european uh uh qualifiers like he's still like possibly a favorite for that i felt like toby seem quite tired by the end of the competition, like by the combined. Yes. Um, and I think maybe Serato as well. And this is some maybe where the likes of Jakob and Adam or I don't know, people who are a bit more seasoned and used to, like they know how to handle these like multi-day 
events um mm-hmm. whereas people like toby and serato like yeah skin tiredness resting yeah. like i wouldn't know how to how to where to begin with all this stuff but um i do think yeah europeans will be really high pressure but it's just one event um i think toby's got a really good mental game but whether you know all this build up and you know having done so well here and come so close maybe maybe he will find it even harder at pan ams at uh, europeans but yeah i don't know for me it, i think the pressure would be bigger on one day i think he came so close here but yeah i don't know i think yeah he, he's he's in good phys- physical shape but maybe the mental game needs a bit more work before taking Possibly. on the content yeah also the continental qualification having to win i think just adds so yeah. much more pressure in general right there's like really no room for error i mean i definitely i think that you know he's one of the athletes that's definitely capable of winning that event but when you have to win there's something about that that i think you just don't have any leeway the same way to, you know taking seven spots versus three you know is less pressure um I also think you said something about, you know, maybe Toby and Serato being a little more tired, you know, as you age as an athlete, you also have to figure out how to take care of your body better. And when you're that young, you're not really used to thinking so far in advance. And, you know, you hope coaches and trainers are helping you with that stuff too. But I do think that that's another part that can be at your detriment as a younger athlete, because you're just so used to having energy. (laughs) And all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're like, wow, I'm exhausted. What do I do? <laughs> I, I want to bring up the the Pan Ams for 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 John and and Megan to talk about now that there is one U.S. male spot still available. Um, now I know a lot of these climbers. Like when you ask them up front, they're going to be like, "No, you know my my qualification pathway is through the OQS. I'm going to do that, and I'll have no problem like ranking in the top ten or whatever." Um, but if you can win the Pan Ams, you don't have to do the OQS, and all of a sudden you've got that those months of runway up to the Olympics to use how you want without having to travel around the world for these events and stuff. So there's definitely something valuable about qualifying at your continental event. So Colin Duffy has reserved a spot. Sean McCall is going to be there to fight for it in Santiago, if I remember right. Um, but who do you think among the U.S. men is is currently kind of like just the the closest thing to a favorite that there is? Like, is it Sean Bailey? Probably. Like, I feel like that's likely where it's at. But do you think there's, you know, you guys know the crushers better than I do. You kind of get into the tier of the Zach Galas and the Ross Fulkersons and, and all these guys that I don't, Jesse Grouper too, I guess, that I don't know super well because they often don't get that far in World Cups. And, and so mm-hmm. I just don't have that much of a gauge on them, but I know they've got good days. Um, what do you guys think? Is Sean Bailey the guy? As far as consistency goes, I think you would, you know, be quick to pick Sean. And I think he's definitely probably highest on the list. Now, Zach Gala, I, he, I think Zach Gala is one of the strongest climbers I've ever met. He's just also one of the most inconsistent, but um, he was, he second at Pan Am's last year or or not not last year, last Olympic cycle, or was he third? I know him and Xander were, one of them was one spot out. I think they Zach is like, the one that lost it. I think. I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and, and he's the one who lost won team it. trials this year. So he definitely could have a day, you know, and walk away as the winner. Sean Bailey, obviously, again, more consistent. Kind of similar, though, to I Mori a little in the sense that sometimes those dynamic movements can really shut him down in bouldering, and that can be a bit of a problem in this combined format. And then you mentioned Ross Fulkerson, another person who could have a spectacular day. So I think the fight at Pan Ams for men is going to be really interesting and then especially for the american men because there is only one spot left there's like that extra added pressure that this could be their last chance even Mm -hmm. yeah that's a that's gonna be a a nutty finish john what about you yeah good luck trying to predict which american man is because (laughs) i think if an american man here's the it's gonna be it's gonna be some crazy come up you know yeah (laughs) absolutely absolutely and because you have think about like Jesse Grouper and I know you were saying you brought up I Mori's name Megan and you almost think of Jesse as having kind of that the the same 
um, likely journey as I Mori in that, okay, Jesse probably won't crush in the bouldering, which will leave him in a big hole heading into the lead round. However, if there is anybody that can maybe say top a route that nobody else can top, it would it would be Jesse Grouper. So totally. I could easily see Jesse Grouper kind of rising above all the rest. But then Sean Bailey is somebody who's, I mean, he's bouldering national champion. He's kind of proven proficient equally at both on maybe different comps and different seasons. But he can win at bouldering. He can win at lead. So uh, I, I, I do see it as a likely fight between the two of them. But then you have, yeah, like Zach Gala, who's proven to, he's been, he's done well back when the combined was the three discipline. He he did really well. So I don't know. And then you have the American women with Annie Sanders now kind of <laughs> seeming to be performatively peaking. And I think a year ago you would have said Natalia would be kind of the shoe in for the, the likely prediction to have that other spot. But now Annie Sanders, we don't know what her ceiling is. So Come on, Nat- <laughs> Natalia's still got to be the favorite for the North American continental, right? Like there's like as much as uh, we might be worried about I, her fluctuation I, I, on a bad I, day. She I has think, to. I, I, I would honestly think Brooke above Natalia, mm-hmm. but then Natalia above Annie. Mm-hmm. But the women have that lucky, less pressure aspect in the sense that only one of them can qualify and there's still another spot. Yeah. So that also is a nice cushion for them. Um, yeah, it's going to be cutthroat. So you, no you, you shifted just... at this point, you think Brooke is, is the more likely one just based on the I, season kind of thing. It's not even just this. I mean, not just the season, but I just feel like her mental and physical game is getting better and better. Whereas Natalia's is kind of going back and forth a lot. So like, sure, there's a chance that Natalia could have a good day, but I just think that Brooks on this kind of a upward trajectory and Natalia's kind of on a roller coaster. So I think consistency wise, I would go with Brooke. John, you feel the same? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it's going to be fascinating because I think the fact that say Brooke and Natalia they didn't qualify here at Burn. I think that that almost has to allow just the seed, the smallest possibility to enter your mind of like, well, maybe I won't make it to the Olympics, right? Like that, that has to sort of before when, when you were so laser focused on burn, there was probably this, it's like, don't tell yourself there isn't, there is that possibility. Like no matter tell yourself, you will get to the Olympics, you will get to the Olympics. But now that burn has taken place, you, you have to think that maybe each of them have kind of sat back and like had that realization or accepted it like yeah maybe it won't happen like maybe this thing that i was hoping for and planning for won't it won't occur and that's going to be it's going to be fascinating to see because will that kind of alleviate some of the pressure from say natalia right like now that she's maybe has kind of reckoned with that like maybe it won't happen will she just go out and then climb completely almost like carefree, right? Like, will that sort of allow this bumpy road that she's kind of been on to just smooth out a little? And she's able to go in to the Continentals saying, whatever happens, happens, right? It didn't work out at burn. And look, I saw that life still goes on. So I'm just going to try my best here. And if it doesn't work out here, life goes on. So I could see Natalia really riding that ship. Uh, But since we only have the statistics from this season so far to go by, I think you have to say if, if sort of the past is prologue from this season and, and we're leading up to, to the next qualification event, you'd, you'd have to give the edge to Brooke at this point. Uh, and yeah. I'll, I'll point out that from this event, Brooke Rabatou has overtaken Natalia Grossman in the Boulder and lead combined ranking not by much but it is the first time that that's happened um was from this so if if the stats help you out with anything then yeah yeah it seems to agree (laughs) at this point let's uh let's talk about speed a little bit and change up change up the questions and and i'll start by saying like if this competition happens at the olympics exactly this comp with the way this all panned out would that be considered a good debut for the speed discipline. What do you think? Was this fun to watch? I know I was really kind of surprised Matt Groom was talking about it. Like this is the most exciting, or maybe he said this was the best speed comp I've ever watched. And 
in in you know the chair he was sitting in obviously the 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 stakes were high and the crowd was crazy and i'm sure there was probably a little bit more of a like european centric crowd there than maybe at some of the other world cups so somebody like mateo having a successful day gets amplified but um was this one of your best speed comps that you've ever watched like did you enjoy this how how did it feel give me give me some thoughts let me start from the bottom with with natalie what did you think about it it was so stressful. I didn't enjoy it. No, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, like, it was exciting <laughs> in one regard. It was just the number of slips. I don't, I've never seen a speed comp like it. And, you know, I don't feel as well up in my speed climbing as I am with the boulder and lead. So I'm not sure if the friction was just completely different or if people were just slipping and feeling nervous and making a mistake in the high pressure environment but yeah I I don't know I don't want to see people <laughs> slipping I want to see people racing neck and neck and that's what the sport's about I want to see people get to the top and hit the buzzer some but... people close to the U.S. team said after practice that it was a very slippery wall and I think that reflected just in like the the times that we were seeing from the athletes was just like you're not getting friction on the smears and you're getting lots of falls right Mm. But yeah, I, for the likes of Ola Miroslav, Vedrick, like people who you don't normally expect to slip, like I don't know if, yeah, I guess nerves could have impacted it as well because it can't just be a technique thing. I, I don't know, but it was just it was just quite stressful to watch, mm -hmm. um, and I felt quite sorry for some of the the ones that didn't <laughs> get it and. Yeah, I don't know, like happy for the ones that got through, but I um, didn't think it was a great presentation of speed climbing. Really. Megan, what about you? Yeah. Do you think it was a good show? I was going to say, I totally agree. Like what we want is, you know, fast neck and neck races. So anytime you have people falling or slipping or false starting, if that happens, like that's not really what we want. I mean, I do think there were some wild moments like, you know just the way it played out and like that brings like a story and drama and I think that that was exciting but if this was the Olympics I think we would want I mean we would want records too we didn't get any world records Emma Hunt got a new American record mm -hmm. on her final run which was awesome but you know people aren't generally paying as much attention to the continental re records as they are as of the world record so I think Mateo I got agree. the European uh, record oh, as well oh, yeah, this one yeah so we got two one, of them, yeah, yeah. right yeah, which that's cool, but we do want world records. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. It was very stressful. Um, but also, it is cool to see how speed can play out in a way that you don't expect it to, which I think if you're a veteran watcher, you know that. But for people new to the sport, I think they think it's a little more um, confirmed based off of the time. So when you see one versing four, like you're like, oh, well, one's going to win. But no, that's not true. <laughs> so yeah. I think that that's interesting. John, is it a good show to have the final race of the competition involve just a single person? Mateo no, I... racing against himself. <laughs> is that a good closer? No, that was an unfortunate <laughs> big final, which is interesting because actually the women's big final was really good. It was, Emma, yes. like we said, Emma Hunt set the, set the American record 6.67. And it was a close race. I think Desac was 6.49, I think, was what her time was. So really pretty closely, uh, pretty close together there. But I kind of, I have to echo everything that was just said. I mean, it was exciting. It was stressful. It was exciting, but probably not the way you want things to pan out. You don't want your world record holder slipping two or three moves up or whatever it was for Miroslaw on the, on the wall. Um I don't know. I yeah, like I, it, it's so when we were trying to think about our winners and losers, I was going to say broadly that I think anybody that barely missed the cut to be an Olympian, you have to feel for them, right? So sure. you, you could kind of put them in the loser category. So it would be, um, let's see here, it'd be Brooke, Serato, uh, Alexander Miroslaw and Ramad Adi Moliono, right? Those were mm -hmm. the four that missed out barely on the Olympic spot. But then I took Alexandra and Ramad off, and I was like, no, I don't think you can put the speed people in the same category as as Brooke and Serato because speed 
you just go into it knowing that nothing is guaranteed. You you go into it like I, I don't I don't want to say it's not as heartbreaking because I'm sure that it was crushing to not get that Olympic slot. But there's just something different about missing it in speed compared to missing out on the Olympic spot in the the combined boulder and and lead. You just you just go. These speed athletes just know that any fluke can happen at any time to anybody. Life's yeah, not in the aluminum like, siding like, business, man. It's just like it comes with the territory <laughs> almost, yeah. But like, you know, the next chance that Alexander has to qualify, like it, it's kind of like the situation with Yana where it would be shocking if she didn't qualify because she is so fast, right? Like it's less of a – that's why you can't really say the speed athletes are losers in, in the loser category because it's not as big of a loss because they're likely to qualify later. Whereas, and combined athletes have a chance too, but it is just a little more competitive or not competitive, but the unknowns with the variables yeah. of the setting I think play into it a bit more. Yeah, it is. It is one of those things where I'm like, I'm not worried for Alexandra at all yeah. getting to the Olympics. Although <laughs> you, you start looking at like, okay, well, there's three. I'll, I'll make the cutoff three if you want to include any other Polish women you can, I guess. But like there's three super fast Polish women that are almost consistently, at least two of them are in the top four of any speed comp. So with one more bad day, that speed ranking in the OQS, if that's what you leave it to, that can change stuff up. So to feel safe, I think all three of those women, Alexandra, Alexandra and Natalia, like all of them want that European spot so mm -hmm. bad, man. And that's just later that's in true. September, I think. Like that's that's going to be the, the real relief because holy crap, if you're going into the OQS and there's only one spot left, that's going to be like, uh, that's that's going to be one of the, the most intense a uh, bit of pressure is, is for those athletes where there's only one spot left for their country for sure. Yeah. So I put a poll out before speed and combined asking like, so what's everybody like most excited about? Are you more excited for the speed or the combined? And I knew everybody was going to say the combined, but I didn't expect it to be like 94% to six of people being more exci excited about the combined final. Um, and I think like, I'm, I'm one of those guys that says like, you know, if we could only pick one discipline to put in the Olympics, I would probably say speed at this point. I think it's just like the most refined discipline. This, was like not the comp to help me make that argument at all so we we're, we're all like at the front desk at the gym i work at and we got the projector up and there's a bunch of staff there and there's a bunch of like customers around and we're all just having a good time watching it and i'm just trying to give brief explainers of like who this is are they a favorite who's the top seed who's not what's their history because most of these people don't watch any speed climbing and so i'm like building up all these favorites and then the second i stop talking it's just like fall out of here and they're like oh okay so this so this random guy um and it was brutal like all these names it was clear who the favorites were and it all fell apart for for Vedric Leonardo it fell apart in the very first race Kiramel falls out Alexander falls out uh uh Li Juan Deng also in the first round that's another person you got to put as like a final favorite um yeah it was uh it was it, for me it was just really unsatisfying like in sports for me if the story is everything, you want some kind of through line that lets you connect the last competition to this competition to the next one. And the only like the the for for Jim Bao Long, it's so painful because he was kind of like the last hope of somebody that's shown some like young consistency over the last couple seasons. Um, for the women's was better. It was satisfying to see Emma Hunt win when she's so often in that cohort of women who are just stuck behind Alexandra Miroslav. And of course, she is um frequently in that top four so it feels like it makes sense and then of course Dezak is is also an extraordinarily satisfying storyline because the joke we made was she only loses to Ola Miroslav right that was the whole thing is the only race she she lost in those first three speed events was when she got put up against uh Miroslav so getting your first win at a world championships and doing it just by surviving the wall that nobody else could was like yeah you deserve this one like you made it through but storyline wise and just presenting the sport, like it didn't have any build up moment. We in a bracket, you kind of want to see approximately who's lining up to to contend with who you want to see some build up of like the favorites are working through the crowd and like I'll take one or two upsets. But this was just too much for me. It uh, it lost all its magic by the time we got the semifinals. And then just to kick you in the pants, <laughs> Alexandra loses her first race in like three years or something. And it's the race that cost her the Olympic qualification. So, uh, yeah, heartbreaking. Yeah, definitely. There was only one false start, though, wasn't there? Or yes. Was 
Yeah, but there was, that's there, always there was, a win. Yeah, <laughs> but, but of course it's in the very the very last race. So I was like, yeah, like I mean, I guess that's good. It's like the numbers yeah. are down, but you just put it in the most important race of the whole that's competition, true, yeah. almost. <laughs> but uh, let, let me pose something that I in re I rewatched the finals, and I think it was in the one fourth the one fourth bracket. Emma Hunt is going up against Yafe Zhao. Uh, and at the top of the route, it's like on the top hold, Emma Hunt kind of bobbles a little bit. And she manages to, she kind of like, it's, it's, I mean, it happens in a split second, but she, it was a little bit of a slip. And then she ended up hitting the buzzer still before Yafe Zhao did. And I was thinking, wow, that one bobble by Emma Hunt, and she managed to stay composed and still win. But what could have been? Because if Emma Hunt... If that bobble is just the fraction a little bit more costly and Yafe Zhao ends up winning that race, then the next bracket is Miroslav versus Yafe Zhao. And I don't know if Miroslav is feeling quite as whatever, nervous, pressure, any of the, anything that, that went into her ultimately slipping off the wall. I don't know if she's feeling that those same feels lining up just against Yafe Zhao. Just less pressure, Zhao, right? If you're, yeah. Yafe, yeah, totally. Yafe Zhao, I think Yafe Zhao's top uh, place at a World Cup is, is 15th, whereas Emma Hunt's a multi-time podium mm -hmm. placer. So you mm -hmm. have to think that the feeling lining up against Emma is a little bit different than lining up against against Yafe Zhao. And so I was just, I was like, wow, the, the details and just the, the so smallest wild. thing in speed climbing ended up maybe making all the difference here. Wild. Yeah. Um, yeah, props to Matteo Zerloni, just the the other person that didn't get a chance to talk too much about. I remember at the start of the season, there was a bunch of hype because there was that video of him and Ludovico Fasali. And I guess, I, I don't know if it was a training camp or Italian nationals, but I think they, I can't remember if they got close to five or if they just got under five, but it was like a hype video that was going around the speed circles. It was like, look out for this guy. Um, and he's consistently made finals, but usually doesn't get out of the round of 16 this season, if I remember right. So this was a pretty big come up. And again, just like Desac, your first speed win at a World Cup or World Championship happens on the big stage. So congratulations again. Like you survived the wall and honestly put in up good times, like getting that close to yeah. five. Like it's not like a... Uh, 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 he's a deserving winner, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Like both of them are. Um, uh, he's he's got the numbers at least. So even if it's not a world record, still still keeping it close to the cutting edge. So fair enough. Um, I want to pivot to finally talk about the um, the broadcast itself, which is something John and I haven't actually spent that much time talking about over the last season for whatever reason. I've just noticed we've been talking a lot more about the climbers than the presentation sort of. Um, so I wanted a chance to talk about if we want to talk about the route setting, if we want to talk about the broadcast, if we want to talk about the, the venue and the crowd and all that kind of stuff and, and see what people feel like. Um, the big one I want to point out, which Natalia or Natalie, I'm going to make this mistake multiple times. I don't, I feel it, it, I've never met Natalia Grossman. I've met you. And so for, I don't know why I'm, why I'm messing this name up, but like Natalie pointed out, we really lost a lot of opportunities to actually see the Olympic moment reaction from so many climbers. Um, yes. Fortunately, we had it for the speed climbers just cause they, they knew instantly all you had to do was win that race in semifinals. But for the combined finals, I think it wasn't until the, so for the women's, did we see any of them technically? Um, we got none of the couch reactions, but for men's, it was really only Tomoa where we got to see a moment of that. But otherwise you would hear the crowd go up and you could tell that, that Jakob had just found out or so-and-so had just found out, but the cameras were not, instead we were getting like montages of climbers from, from like 20 minutes ago. And that was the I moment, like that was the moment that this whole like combined winning a combined championship doesn't matter, right? Like this discipline will be dead and buried in five years and it won't exist anymore, right? And nobody, and you ask all the athletes when you go to the press conference, what mattered more to you today? Like winning this world championship or getting the Olympic ticket? And they all say the Olympic ticket. So I, I, it should have been a priority. It's definitely an opportunity lost because those are the moments that you end up putting in in all of your clips for the next couple of years and in all the retrospectives, you know, in, in 10, 15 years when Yanya retires, that's the clip you put in and we don't have it. Nobody got it. It, it was just really unfortunate. It was like one of, it's it, arguably those are the moments that the whole week was building up to and it was not on the show and that really sucked. I agree. 
it, it I, was like, such. Yeah, I was. I was yeah, no, sorry. Go for it, Megan. Oh no, I was just gonna say like it started with you know Shauna being like I don't think Jesse knows yet. Does she know? And like listening in your and I'm in. They're building up the like, hype. Yeah, her on the screen, and I like want to see her crying with like tears of joy, and then we get nothing, and it was like such a letdown. Yeah, and I, and like you said, we got a little of Tamoa, and I think we got a little bit, a tiny bit from the kiss and cry of like Colin's reaction and. Jakob is maybe like half a second, but I don't think mm-hmm. we got their like best reactions by any means. And I think Yanya pretty much knew soon after when she got off and we could kind of tell that she knew a bit, but yeah, those moments and that, and that's what's setting us apart, right. From other sports and the way people market the sports for the Olympics and all of the fluff pieces and whatnot, the, those moments in, of storytelling that are really important and we're not getting that. And I feel like I've been lucky enough a lot of times to be at the events, but then like watching it on my computer or the TV, I was like, oh my gosh, this sucks. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't want to see, you know, a slow-mo move of the move I saw 10 minutes ago again. Like, it was slow enough the first time, not in slow-mo. Like, I really hate those little highlight clips after everything. It's such a waste of camera time. (laughs) (laughs) I just want to pull up, uh, I just found it here, a post that Bjorn Pohl made, photographer who was there in Bern, and he shared this post of the moment the three male uh, competitors realized uh, uh, that they had won. So this this is just an intro slide, but there is Jakob Schubert, I guess, like, getting confirmation from the Austrian team. I'm going to skip the call in one real quick and go to the Tomoa <laughs> one again, like just this little moment that we missed, but the call in Duffy one, how could we not get this face on camera? That's amazing. Like, that's, I want that big jacked goofy face all across my screen. in the moment he realizes he's back at the Olympics, like, come on now. The, we, we really yeah. did miss some big moments. It's too, uh, too bad that that stuff went, went on. It, it was, it was such a glaring omission that I, do wonder if maybe somebody got like maybe the Olympic channel got them and they're saving them for some mm. sort of video package Ooh. or something to be released at no a later way. date. <laughs> I, I don't know. And I'm not endorsing that. I, I wish they would have shown it, but just because that is such an obvious thing to capture, I'm wondering if maybe there's just something a little that they're, they're cooking up uh, maybe well, an, see, outside of the This is the, the thing IFSC. that I'm worried about is I'm worried it wasn't an obvious thing to capture, right? I'm worried it was, it was you know, so focused on how we're presenting the climbing. This is a new scoring format. We've got all this stuff like lined up in terms of like, you know, the overlays with the scoring. And, and maybe it was the thing that went missing, even though... At World Cups, there's always a, a floor camera, right? And whether they yeah. are panning at the crowd or panning at the climber untying or, or whatever, maybe it was just an oversight and just in the in the craziness of the World Championships, we just forgot to, <laughs> to like to well, to broadcast this moment. But it's just such a bad one to miss, man. And and were they so focused though, and not to pick on their <laughs> graphics, but like the Klimpy section of the route, like who did the proofreading? Like I like I there's a lot of questions I have. <laughs> that was the most unfortunate, like cultural typo I've ever seen in my life. Just knowing that the online observation guy is from Japan. I was like, this is setting stereotypes back to the nineteen forties for sure. Yeah. Um, I did laugh, but I couldn't type any jokes because they were all absolutely inappropriate in that moment but yeah there there was there was a bunch of like little like little mess ups yeah what i was i was really happy that the scoring seemed to be keeping up faster when we got to the finals because that was such a hindrance in the semifinals. it was like okay so what they come off the wall and the score still hasn't updated yet on the screen that was really tough to understand what was happening so yeah great job Mm -hmm. for fixing it for finals for the most part um yeah. Any anybody else have any like nitpicks or, or like successes or anything? Like I think we can agree the crowd was pretty good, right? Like solid. oh, the venue was amazing yeah. and the crowd was amazing. Yeah, I feel like I I really want to give the photographers a shout out, like on the back of mm. the broadcast, not really getting us everything. Again. Yeah, like well, there were like fifty photographers, probably the most photographed mm. event aside from maybe Tokyo, but just. Yeah, having that many skilled climbing photographers like Lena, um, John Glassberg. Um, oh, is Glassberg out there too? Yeah, yeah he was. So Who's he eight, shooting but... for? Do I'm you not know? sure. Yeah. Um, he... I know he's been working on a thing with Natalia for a while, so I, I don't know if oh, that was part so of it. so he might be doing kind of like a journey to the, like, kind of like following. Yeah. Like, okay, gotcha. Okay. 
but yeah just to have that many professional photographers and like the shots they were getting they just seemed to get better and better every competition mm. and I think they did a really good job of catching what the camera the film cameras missed and yeah just being able to flick through the albums on Instagram and see the reactions was really yeah. cool it's very hard to keep up with all the all of the different like photographers because there are so many but I did like <laughs> seeing that there are more and more of them that are are trying some different stuff with how they present photos and and how they frame their shots and what it is they're trying to catch or maybe just what they're sharing right like maybe a little bit of like you know post editing and uh and presenting them in kind of a creative way because there's so many photographers it is nice that they can kind of differentiate a bit and I'm sure Eddie has his own like comments on and I'm sure he'd have his own <laughs> own, own criticisms of some of them and 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 he I'm sure he's a fan of a lot of them too but uh but yeah it is kind of nice because we have so many that we're getting some different like flavors um in the photos john about the crowd for you like did you did you enjoy the crowd crowd shots all that stuff i thought the crowd was good i if i was the production manager i think i would be very cognizant of not showing crowd shots or, or shots of the wall when in the background there are empty seats and i know that they said that the reason was because if on those seats you you can't see the wall and i i totally understand that but i'm just thinking any sporting event that, that's kind of like uh what camera work 101 is try your best not to include shots of like of large empty seats portions yeah. of empty seats <laughs> yeah uh so that was unfortunate but yeah the crowd was great i loved the signs that everybody was holding up and uh and I will say, aside from the crowd, I love that they had press conferences because that's something that I've yeah. been saying for a long time. I wish they had those at every World Cup. It's great that we got the press conferences. And it's also good preparation for the people that qualified for the Olympics because, you know, they are going to have a lot of press conferences uh, in the in the build up now to Paris. And now I know how yeah, all I the athletes feel. So that's good, too. <laughs> Yeah, because I feel like the last Olympics, a lot of them, you could tell, like when you're watching them get interviewed um, after each round or whatever, they were like kind of not expecting to have to talk to that many people. So I agree. I think it's really good media training. <laughs> yeah, media tra my, my, my pet peeve is that I, I texted you, Tyler, and I was like, why is somebody, why are all these athletes so reluctant to say that their goal for Paris is to win the Olympic gold? Because the, uh, if people listen to the press conference, the, the gentleman who asked the question, he said, I think I probably already know the answer, but what is your goal for Paris? And in my head, I'm thinking your answer is a few words to win gold. That's, that's your goal. <laughs> and we got so much dancing around it and, oh, I want to enjoy it and I want to stay injury free. And I'm not I'm not devaluing all that. That's all absolutely true. But in my head, I'm like, I'm like, we know your goal is to win. Mm -hmm. You know, deep down, your goal is to win. Like nobody goes to the Olympics for a participation trophy. You want to win the gold. Everybody knows it. So just just tell us. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like that's yeah. a very, very climber thing to do to avoid stating what you want. <laughs> Yeah, I just imagine true, yeah. sitting beside Yanya Garnbrett, though, like sitting beside Yanya Garnbrett and trying to tell thousands of people like, yes, I plan on winning with Yanya sitting right beside you. I just imagine her putting like her that's hand true. on your lap and just giving you a little pat on the thigh like, oh, you know, that's a nice that's a cute dream. A cute dream. <laughs> Remember who you're sitting beside, guys. Come on. <laughs> Oh, um, what Tyler, you... you you and I were texting about that. Imagine I Mori saying that, sitting next to Yanya, saying, "I want to beat. I'm, I plan to beat Yanya," and then just dropping the mic and yeah. that the, the that viral video so of the whole press conference. That's that's the only All English she decides like to MMA learn, right? Fighters. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Let me uh, let me ask you about the commentary because I think there's always a lot of conversation around commentary. Um, and again for a unique sport where we kind of just have a single person that's responsible for doing all the commentary and analysis. And, and this time around, we got two. Shauna Coxie hops in on kind of a, a, a full-time basis for this event, possibly some more events from, from what we're maybe hearing. Um, what did you think? What did you think of the dynamic? What did you think she brought to it? I've heard lots of good comments. I've heard lots of bad comments, but that could literally come you know, regardless of who you put in that chair. Um, so what did you think about the balance? You Did you like their, their chemistry, all that? Um, Natalie, let me start with you. Yeah, I think Matt and Shauna have got good chemistry. Shauna clearly knows what she's talking about. Um, her analysis of body movement and hips and everything. <laughs> it was. I think people really appreciated that. I think for us, maybe we understand climbing quite well but for newcomers to the sport I think it probably added to the experience like I don't maybe might have confused them a bit but I think she was 
very clear and she's really a good communicator I think um she's obviously done a lot of media stuff in the run-up to Tokyo and she's confident at explaining all these complicated things in the scoring system Mm -hmm. to newcomers yeah that that was what she did really well I think just adding stats and analysis of the scores because I did feel for Matt like if he's on his own and with the combined format it's quite a lot of maths to do but having someone on your side crunching the numbers and you know even if you're getting help from people back home or like I think she she mentioned whatsapp at some point you know Mm -hmm. I had that in Tokyo as well just like people feeding you information because it's hard to keep on top of everything but I think she did a really good job that's one of the hardest things about historical stats is is uh you know these commentators have a suite of tools in front of them where they can hypothetically access hundreds and hundreds of stats but you you do have to have a little bit of knowledge to understand okay what should i be looking for what stat makes this more interesting what's relevant in this context right and so for shauna who has a personal relationship with so many of them uh who understands a lot of their history it was probably a lot easier for her to say oh you know in this scenario it is unique that Jacob is in this particular situation and so that gave her a much better starting point for the stats rather than random climber that gets sat down with a laptop and yeah. and all you can be is like yeah they've competed in 99 world cups and you're like cool i don't give a shit but thanks appreciate it like you know it's not relevant to this situation at all you did your best but again having some historical knowledge makes that a lot easier too megan what do you think yeah um well i'm gonna be honest i only listened to the commentary for the finals i for whatever reason, I often don't listen to the commentary. I think it's my own thing because I don't want to get too in my head about my own commentary when I do it. Sure. But I did listen to it for both the men's and women's combined finals um, and the speed finals. Um, and I, I thought they had great chemistry. I really loved what Shauna brought to the broadcast. I think um, she has a nice voice to listen to as well. I think that that's a, another part of being in the broadcast. I do think the, you know, the biggest thing that people fall victim to is just talking too much Mm -hmm. in general. And I think that happened a little bit with both of them, but like not in an annoying way. It's just, you know, things can be cleaner at times. Right. And, but that's like a very minor, minor thing. I thought they did a great job. One thing I did notice a couple of times is I swear sometimes when they would stop talking, I could hear whispering and I don't know what that was about. Um, but I would be a little careful about that a bit more is the only thing. Um, but I thought I thought it was great. It was really entertaining. And I think she brings a lot of emotion to it, too, um, because of the connection, which I also really appreciate. So I liked it. I, I do. I did feel like sometimes it was a little long winded and kind of, and, and just kind of uh, you you keep thinking of new points to add, whereas sometimes the best thing to do is finish your point and then pass it back. Right. Let, like, you know, Matt's really good at setting people up. That's kind of his entire job is, mm-hmm. you know, blah, 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 blah. What do you think? Or what's your reaction? What not? And I think that's something that would, you know, shoot Shauna up into it. Like a very high tier of commentary is just play a little bit of team ball, um, pass it back to the person that set you up. But and then that's something you learn with time or or if you have the right um, instruction from the beginning. I feel like, Mm -hmm. for example, when I started doing it, we had people who had worked with ESPN for years, worked on the Olympics for years. And I got that like very specific instruction right from the start. Right. Um, But I, I, I would imagine Nobody gave her any instruction because every time I've worked with IFSC, no one's yeah, I just sit down and you start like it's not it's not um, as uh, as intent. And then that's always a joke, too. They're like, oh, we're not like ESPN. It's very chill, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Which has its ups and downs, funny. right? You know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. And I mean, I mean, in saying that there are moments when we were doing shows that were going to be for the linear TV version where like I was sometimes scared to say too much and I had to like really make sure I was so clean and <laughs> You know, that's a different level of stress as well. There, That right. free flow is also really nice. But yeah, I thought she did an amazing job. I thought they made a great pair and it was a joy to listen to. Yeah. John, what about you? Anything from yeah. the commentary or just production yeah. in general? 
I thought it was, I really enjoyed the commentary. Of course, when we get to the combined finals, it's like day 12 or something like that. So I'm sitting there thinking, geez, I'm not going to, I'm I'm not going to criticize these people too much because I can't imagine having to do 12 days worth of commentary, but granted that is the job. So, so we can certainly um, kind of nitpick, but overall I thought it was really good. I agree with what you said about maybe long winded here and there. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed what they had to say. I thought they had good chemistry. And it sounded like Shauna kind of teased us at the end with maybe they'll be doing commentary again together at some point. And so I was thinking, I don't know if that means on the World Cup circuit or if it means that they will be the team for the Olympics. But they kind of uh, they dropped some little hint of like, yeah, maybe you'll hear us again in events to come. And so I'm really curious to see. I don't remember what tweet this was, or but it did. Uh, Natalie, you might have a better memory than me. But was it for European Championships and maybe Coper? They're lined up, but I thought they, they or not European Champs, like the European Qualifier. I wanted yeah, to say. Yeah, I think it might be Laval that rings. Laval. Yes. I think so, they're doing at least one other event, but right. I'm not sure. Yeah, Which yeah, one. yeah. It'll be good. It'll and be I, nice. Go I will say too, like I'm just really thankful that they decided to have a second commentary person and weren't taking people i mean this event is so important and if we really yeah. want to make our sport more watched by people and really get to the level that some other sports are i think it's necessary so i'm so glad the ifsc and Eurosport reached out to shauna and are in there having her doing that and possibly more of them mm -hmm. because i think that level of professionalism is really important and i think that going forward that should be how it is is you can't just be pulling people who don't make a final or a semi-final it's just it's just not the same <laughs> yeah and i would love to have somebody who does the interviews at the end be somebody different from the person in the commentary mm -hmm. booth and maybe then that would even allow for more interviews throughout the live stream throughout the broadcast if you had somebody mm -hmm. that didn't have to be pulled away out away from the the booth there because it's always kind of like, oh, Shauna, you've got to go. And so then all of a sudden it's just Matt on the call. And and I was I, I mean, of uh, still course still my favorite part of the broadcast is just listening to Matt wax poetic about whatever is on camera <laughs> after the cough is done. I just like I could that's make that a podcast that I can fall asleep to. Uh, so I love it. But also even as that person doing the interview, it's like always super hectic to get down to where you're supposed to go. Every venue is different. There's always people in the way and it's like you get there, you're out of breath. You're trying to figure out where you're going to stand, what you're, mm -hmm. you're going to say, all of the things. So, yeah, I agree. Another person would be great for that. Yeah. And imagine if somebody had that job, then as the final round is progressing, they could be jotting notes like, OK, if this person wins, I definitely want to be asking them this. If this person wins, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask them this. So I, they could have kind of some questions prepared as opposed mm -hmm. to, of course, because of the reasons you just said. It's it's very much like on the fly. And yeah, I know I'm not the only you can one jot down watch. notes a little, but you're still like having to sprint to like your person you're interviewing. Can we can, can we all agree that a better question than how do you feel would just like if you just need like a default question, if you hadn't had a chance to take notes, would just be to ask, like, tell me what you thought about that climb. Like, is that mm -hmm. not like a, a way to like open athletes up more to talk about something they actually are thinking about and like are willing to talk about is like, yeah, that move like this, that blah, blah, blah. Like, I feel like that's honestly like a better starting point. If you have no idea what to ask is just ask them about climbing rather than feelings like i feel like you'll get so much more out of it when you have that opportunity I, I think that's where it's kind of important to know who you're talking to like if you know you're talking to an athlete who does have feelings and like likes to share those feelings hmm. and emotions and all of that that's fine but i i do agree with you it's a safe route to go is to talk about the climbing if someone's a little more closed off um that's something that i started paying attention to a little bit lately because sometimes people who you ask them how they feel and they're like, uh, I don't have any feelings. I don't know. I don't like talking about my feelings a lot, <laughs> you know, and then you have to like divert to something else. But yeah, the climbing is a safe bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me, let me ask for closing thoughts. Cause we're, we're quite deep into this and we should try and keep it under two hours. You've all been very generous. So I'll start with John. Cause he's usually got notes, Megan, Natalie, if you have any closing thoughts you want to add uh, after you're welcome to. So John, uh, Anything we didn't hit or, or just wrap ups for this world championships before we pack it away for two more years? I, I think that I, I come away from this thinking that the big winner now is really the fans because the rest of the Olympic 
qualification. So diplomatic. Oh my God. Well, think about how, <laughs> think about how the rest of the Olympic pathway qualification pathway just got a lot more interesting because there are so many big names that are still vying for those Olympic tickets. And on top of that, so many of these big names who we kind of thought might have the ticket by now, they have to go back. They have to reset. They have to kind of restructure their training. Probably they have to refocus their mindset, recompose. And that adds to the unpredictability because we don't know how many of them will be able to thrive in having to readjust like that and how many might, it just might be too much. So I, I started with, I, I guess we didn't do headlines, but my headline was going to be something about like this event delivers shock and awe or something. But I think the shocks are still <laughs> yet to come. I think we're going to see, I, I think we that we're still going to get a lot of surprises in the rest of the qualification events and uh it's going to be fun to watch i take back my diplomatic comment you just drop some some solid bush militarism like <laughs> stuff in there like yeah, yeah okay anyway yeah megan what about you any final thoughts um yeah i guess just to piggyback on what john was saying i think this whole thing is unpredictable and there are only so many spots and Given that the first qualification for combined only allotted three spots, a lot of people had to know going in that they might not get that spot, even though they're an incredible athlete. And I think what's going to be interesting is seeing how everybody handles that on an individual basis. I think we'll see some pretty cool sports moments happen, but then I'm sure there'll be some devastation along the way as well. All in all, I really enjoyed watching it and I can't say that I always feel that invested and it, at home that is when I'm there, I'm so invested, but when I'm at home, it's a little harder for me to, you know, be as excited watching the competition. And I found myself really on the edge of my seat watching on my phone. So I thought it was really, really exciting. Natalie, you. I wondered if, cause a lot of the feel the, because it was so surprising, I did wonder if some people maybe just deliberately weren't choosing to peak at this time. Because it was so different to Hatchy OG, mm -hmm. where you had eight or nine spots. I did wonder if some of like that mid-pack surprise group, like who didn't make combined semis or didn't make the finals, I wonder if some of those surprises were kind of just intentional, or like just naturally where they are at the moment, and they weren't necessarily aiming to peak just now and maybe that's where we'll see them shine in september october at the continentals and the oqs so yeah it just it, i did i just wasn't sure whether they were actually off days or it's just where they're at, at the moment so. mm -hmm. yeah that is an interesting perspective that, i mean if that is deliberate for some people that could that could change a lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my final thoughts. I I agree. I thought I actually really enjoyed watching this one. I thought it was well done. I think the the whole organizing committee did an excellent job. Like the broadcast seemed great. From what I hear, the experience in the place, aside from maybe the temperature on the last day, everything was was really good okay. over there. So props to the city of Bern and the volunteers and the root setters and whatnot. Um, yeah, and then also like final notes, uh, Alexandra, you could have gone four in a row, but you didn't. And look what you got out of it. Same thing to you, Mejdi. Could have gone three in a row, bouldering wins, but you didn't. You threw it away and you didn't get anything here either. So that's got to get back in the World Ooh. Cup circuit, guys. Come on. <laughs> Give me, give me those Man. moments. Give me that history. Um, I think my, my actual biggest takeaway is uh, uh, a little disappointed to think that maybe these next two World Cups where we wrap up the lead season might be kind of underattended. I think it was so yeah. nice to look at this comp and think, wow, everybody's here. And it made it feel awesome. It made it feel stacked and exciting the whole way through. And there was no asterisks for almost anything. If there was, it was like, okay, what's the root setting like? You know, is this like, you know, too tall for Aimori, blah, blah, blah. But it was never about, well, look at all the people that didn't show up. So your medal doesn't matter. Like Mikhail Mawem wins that gold medal, medal over everybody. Everybody showed up. And so I, it was, I think, a very satisfying week and it's going to, maybe hurt a little bit to go to Koper and go to China and feel like, oh, we're back to 
this being kind of like a casual experience. So just to end it on a down note, I guess. <laughs> it's, the, it's the trip to McDonald's after the steak dinner, kind of, yeah, you know? Yeah. 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 Like, kind of like, uh, yeah, well, there you go. this is what we have. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks to everybody for watching. Of course, you can follow all of our guests on Instagram. Their handles are on screen. But also for John and for Natalie, you can of course, of course, actually subscribe to the publications that they uh, that they write for. Support climbing journalism where you can. You can support me on Patreon. You can support an upstart called Max, uh, HBO Max. You can support them <laughs> to to help out Megan's <laughs> Megan's little hobby yeah, show. Yeah, they're really hurting. Yeah, they have yeah, no yeah. money. <laughs> you can support all of this, all of this equal climbing journalism. Uh, just check out the links below so you can do that. Of course, join the Plastic Weekly Discord to chat with us. Uh, and aside from that, we've only got two more World Cups left, but a lot of qualifying. So the debrief will keep coming to you. So until the next one, thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you soon.